is a great delight for me to be able to be back with you as a congregation again. I was here early in the time when you first came into the PCA and have had several visits since that time and look forward to coming back. I had hoped my wife would be able to come on this trip. We were planning on it, but she's developed a hip problem. In fact, she is scheduled now for hip replacement in right after Christmas. And so uh, she will have to wait and come do that after that replacement is done. We'll have to look for, to the future for that. But uh, I do I have enjoyed being with you all this weekend and uh, look forward now to <coughs> this part, portion of the service that, and trust that God will bless the ministry of the word as we open his word and look at it. Uh, the book of Isaiah is one of those great prophecies, great books in the scripture if you go back to the very first verse of the book, it's entitled, The Visions of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And so his, his period, he came to the, near the end, he rose up as a prophet near the end of the period of King Uzziah, and then prophesied during these other uh, kingships as well, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Uh, the northern kingdom is at the point of falling during this same time. This is about a hundred years or a little bit more than a hundred years before the fall of the southern kingdom, and he has to prophesy some of that coming uh, destruction that is going to come even upon the southern kingdom, Judah, which is where he prophesied. The sixth chapter describes what is often called the, the call of Isaiah, where he has that vision in the temple, uh, the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And you have him a, a, an example of worship before God, God's appearance to, to Isaiah, Isaiah's confession of sin, just as we've done in the service of worship this morning, in a sense, opening with the singing to the praise of God and then confession of our sins and then the call to service and the commitment of Isaiah in response. And that really gives us a pattern for worship period that in a sense, it's a dialogue between God and his people. We come into the house of the Lord ready to sing to his glory. We confess that we're not worthy of doing so. We trust and put our trust in the Savior and then we have the call to service in the ministry of the word and the commitment of our personal persons to that service. Uh, now, in the seventh chapter, which is where I want to read from this morning, we find a particular passage of prophecy that uh, culminates in what we call the prophecy of the virgin birth. Uh, let us follow God's word then, beginning with Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1. And I'm reading from a number of you have asked me, and I failed to mention this, reading from the American Standard Version of 1901. Uh, that was a very literal attempt, a very literal translation of both the Hebrew and the Greek text. And I think it's the best translation of that sort that has yet been presented. The New King James Version is probably closest to it of the newest of the translations. Uh, the New American Standard is not as good as this, and the New International is not as good as this as being really a literal translation. And so I've always, from the time I began teaching Bible at Belhaven College a number of years ago in the 50s, uh, have, have been using this Bible as my Bible both to teach and to preach from, and trust that you'll be able to follow it with whatever version you may have. Isaiah 7 verse 1. It came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jothan, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. Syria is the, is the city or, or the country with Damascus as its head, as its uh, capital city. Ephraim is another name for Israel, the northern kingdom. Uh, Syria is confederate also with Ephraim, and his heart trembled. That is the 
Ahaz, the king of the line of David there. His heart trembled and the people, the heart of his people, as the trees of the forest trembled with the wind. Then said Jehovah unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz thou and Shiraz Jashub thy son at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. And say unto them, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither let thy heart be, be faint because of these two tales of smoking firebrands. For the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remaliah, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have purposed evil against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us and set up a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabeel. Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass, this plot of the, of the northern kingdom in Syria against Judah. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken in pieces, the destruction of the northern kingdom, so that it shall not be a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. And Jehovah spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of Jehovah thy God. Ask it, either in the depth or in the height of above. above. And there's God at telling him to ask for a sign that he might know that this is a prophecy from God. And Ahaz, in a sense, a, sense, in a, 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 a pious a, a, a sort of an attitude, says, uh, Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt Jehovah. It's a pious hypocrisy, really. He didn't want to, to have this prophecy made sure to him. And he said, Hear, this is Isaiah, he said, Hear now ye now, O house of David. Is it, is it a small thing for you to weary men that you will weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Let me go on and finish the paragraph. Butter and honey shall he eat when he knoweth to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings thou abhorrest shall be forsaken. Jehovah will bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days and, 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 have, and ha that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. It's not Syria that's going to come. As the king of Assyria, the next country further uh, eastward, is going to come and override that whole portion of uh, the country at that time. May God add his blessing to this reading and hearing of his word. Let's ask his blessing upon the ministry of the word. We thank thee, our Heavenly Father, for thy word, for the assurance that we have that it is thy word. And we pray that now as we open it, that thou wilt by thy Holy Spirit guide that which is spoken here, that it may be true to thy word. And further, that thou wilt open the hearts of those who are here to listen and to hear and to understand and to receive this word and to apply it to their own hearts and to their own lives. So wilt thou bless the ministry of the word to all of us now. We ask it in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We have in that 14th verse the, the prophecy of the virgin birth. You know, in the modern age, this is one of the things that is laughed at and mocked by the liberals, the unbelievers, who cannot believe in such an event as this. And they have various other explanations for the coming of Jesus. Uh, but none of them, of course, match what the Bible says. Uh, the question has some, sometimes been raised whether this passage is really speaking about the coming of the Messiah. That Matthew quotes it and says that the birth of Jesus was the fulfillment of this passage. Now, as you look at it, and as, as I read beyond 
the passage it's or the virgin birth prophecy itself talks about the child growing up and the fact that within say five or six years time that the child is able to discern good and evil and so forth that uh, within that framework that these two kingdoms uh, to the north of Judah Israel and Syria are going to be overrun by Assyria now does that mean that the child was actually born during that time and during his lifetime this thing happened I think our best understanding on the basis of what we know they especially know that Matthew under the inspiration of the Spirit says this prophecy is not fulfilled until the birth of Jesus is to say what you have here is Isaiah taking the life of a child an ordinary child as it were and as a ruler and even though it's talking about something that takes place uh, 700 years later in the virgin birth of Christ in the birth of Christ he can take that calendar of what time it would be for a child to come to be able to know good and evil and speak and so forth and to take that rod and that that measuring stick and place it down in history right there in their time and say within that length of time Syria and and Ephraim or the Israel are going to be overrun by Assyria and so I don't think we need to assume that Isaiah is confused here uh, or that the Bible is in any way wrong in t giving us the prediction of the virgin birth which Matthew says was not fulfilled until the time of the coming of Jesus and saying well he's actually talking about a child that's born in, in that period there was no virgin birth born in, or in that period and uh, so uh, that was simply it's not that but it, rather as I say taking the measuring stick of that length of time uh, five six seven years twelve years whatever you want to say that length is put it down over here in the history of the of uh, Ahaz and, and and the country of Judah at that time and say within that period the northern kingdom and Syria will have been overrun by Assyria and that did happen exactly now the other thing that sometimes is raised against this being a reference to the virgin birth is that the language is not technically the word virgin in the Hebrew and the reason for that is that this word could be descriptive of a betrothed a young woman who was betrothed to be married to a young man and that sometimes the virginity was not preserved during that period of the betrothal so that that word technically did not necessarily preserve the concept the best the translation that we perhaps would make of the word would be a damsel an older English word that we don't use so much today or a maiden and these people are always righteous young women righteous young women who had not yet married damsel or maiden we don't think of them as married young women but unmarried righteous young women and dr. E.J. Young in his dis discussion of this matter says it's this that actually Isaiah used the best possible word in the Hebrew to really convey the idea of a virgin birth in other words the word uh, virgin itself uh, it is not the best word because it did not always mean the preservation of the virginity <coughs> whereas the word that was used was a word that did carry with it that connotation connotation a righteous young woman unmarried shall bear a child and so in the it's very interesting in the Greek translation of the Hebrew what we call the Septuagint around 200 BC they translated it with the word the Greek word virgin in other words they understood that's what the writer the uh, uh, Isaiah is trying to convey it was not using that technical word virgin but it was con connoting that idea of a righteous young unmarried young woman having a child which meant what we now speak of as the virgin birth and I think that one of the things that we certainly must insist upon uh, is the fact that the Bible does teach this very matter now if you posit the idea that the Messiah was not virgin-born 
that he was born either of the reunion between Joseph and Mary, or as many uh, things or, or myths suggest, a Roman soldier perhaps having uh, uh, taken Mary and that the, he was entirely an illegitimate child. What you have then is a child born with a sinful nature. Not possible to be a savior. You see, what the virgin birth preserves, although it's never spelled out in Scripture so much for us, but it preserves the fact that the Messiah was not descended by the ordinary generation from Adam and Eve, and thereby a sinner by nature, with a sinful nature. You and I all have received just that. David, in, in the Psalm 51, when he's ready to confess his sins, he speaks to that very effect that, that was it, it, his mother was a sinner and therefore uh, he was uh, a sinner. He says in Isaiah 51, 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Not that the act of the conception was sinful, but in a sinful nature. And one of the things that David is confessing there and some of the Puritans have pointed out it's more difficult to do what, what David did than we want to do. We are ready to say, oh yes, I've made mistakes. I've sinned. But David is saying, I'm a sinner. And that ultimately is what we need to come to recognize. It's not just that we've committed things that are wrong and done things wrong. We all know we've done that. And you know what the Roman, Roman Catholic sort of concept that, that it, we, is part of our culture. Well, after all, we're only human. And that's really putting the blame on God. We're only human. We can't do any better. But the fact is, as David says, in sin was I conceived. In a sinful nature, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. And so he speaks about the sinfulness of his nature. Every child descended from Adam has inherited that sinful nature. Except for this one that was not directly descended from Adam in that way. The Holy Spirit planting the Lord Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He does not inherit the sinful nature, but rather he is born without sin and therefore can be the savior of human sinful beings. He had a true human nature. His being implanted in the womb of the Virgin Mary uh, it gives him the true human nature, but it is without the transmission of the sinful nature that would be passed down from him by ordinary generation. And so our catechism speaks all mankind by their fall, uh, sin, or, or, or fell with him or, or, by ordinary generation, sinned in him and uh, fell with him in his first transgression. And, but, but it's the ordinary generation. Jesus had extraordinary generation. And the virgin birth is one of the things that we need to continue to affirm and clearly state that this is the case. Now, this passage is in overall the section 7 through chapter 7 through 9 or even perhaps on through 11 is what one of the commentators calls the Emmanuel passage. Because the name of this one that is to be born of this virgin is to be given the name Emmanuel. And as the New Testament translation of this in, in Matthew speaks of it, uh, which is God with us. That's what that word means. God with us. And those of you who have been with us in this series, remember that we pointed out that the Abrahamic covenant really was the first clear expression of that when God said unto Abraham in Genesis 17, 7, I will be a God unto you and to your seed after you for an everlasting covenant. Be a God to you and to your seed after you. The Emmanuel principle and the tabernacle planted in the midst of Israel. God with us. God dwelling in the midst of his people. And then the temple eventually at Jerusalem. God dwelling in the midst of his people and the, and the tribes all settled around it in the various places within the nation of Israel. And here that theme comes through again. As you look on at the eighth 
chapter of this book and it speaks about the coming of what this this Assyrian uh, sweeping across this land verse 5 Jehovah spake unto me yet again saying for as much as this people have refused the waters of Shiloh that go, and they, that go softly and rejoice in Rezin and Remaliah Judah was, uh, was looking that direction now therefore behold the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river that's the Euphrates that's Assyria the waters of the river strong and many even the kingdom of Assyria and all his glory and it shall come up over all its channels and go up over all its banks and it shall sweep onward into Judah and it shall overflow and pass through it shall reach even to the neck and the stretching out of the, its wings shall fill the breadth of that thy land O Emmanuel the prophet breaks out with that as his cry O God be with us as he hears this prophecy Assyria is going to come it's going to sweep over Israel the northern kingdom it's going to sweep southward even to the neck of Judah and Sennacherib you remember came down uh, to, upon Jerusalem and sought to take it and was turned back by God bringing a plague upon them in the over, overnight and he, he goes on to speak make an uproar O ye peoples be broken in pieces give ear to all ye far, of, of a far country and gird yourselves and be broken in pieces gird yourselves and be broken in pieces take counsel together and it shall be brought to naught speak of the word and it shall not stand for Emmanuel this translates it here for God is with us that this note of the hope they were going to be spared from this uh, flood of the Assyrians coming all the way to their neck but not overflowing them and so you have that assurance then and so this is sometimes spoken of as the section of the book of Isaiah called the book of Emmanuel now in the ninth chapter he picks up again the theme of a child to be born and he talks about the, the coming of the gospel to the section around Galilee uh, opening that, that chapter but there shall be no gloom to her that was in anguish in the former times he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali they were among the first parts of the northern kingdom that were carried away captive he brought them into contempt but in the latter time hath it he made it glorious by the way of the of the, excuse me by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan Galilee of the nations and we know that the Lord Jesus went there and made that as his headquarters while he was appear upon the earth and we think of the Sea of Galilee and his ministry that just comes to our minds now the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shined thou hast multiplied the nation thou hast increased their joy they joy before thee according to the joy and harvest as men rejoice when they divide the spoil for the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor thou hast broken as in the day of Midian you remember uh, as the Midianites and, and Gideon had broken the, 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 uh, the Midianites and their, their invasion upon the, country, uh, the nation so as in the day of Midian so this is broken now for all the armor of the armed men and in the tumult of the garments your old in blood shall be burning for fuel of fire for unto us a child is given and Isaiah has returned to this child then for unto us a child is is born unto excuse me I read it wrong in that first unto us a child is born it's a human child but it's a son not just born but who is given and who is he he's the eternal son of God as John 3 16 says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that one who was already only begotten in the all eternity the begotten son of God eternally begotten son of God is given in this child 
And so this passage is, is not just saying it redundantly, a child is born, a son is given. No, they have two different meanings. The child is born talking about his, his humanity. He was born of this virgin. And who is it? The Son of God, who is given unto us. And then you have the celebration of his government, the messianic rule. The government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I don't know whether some of your more recent translations may couple these together. They fall together as two Hebrew words in each one of the phrases. And probably the comma doesn't belong between Wonderful and Counselor. But rather a wonder of a Counselor, a Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And as you... Uh, think about those names. You remember when uh, Samson was to be born and his father Manoah asked who it is that, that has spoken to him to announce the coming of Samson. And he says, my name is a wonder. And so that name is a name that really is descriptive of God. A wonderful counselor. A wonder of a counselor. That's who he is. He's one who is to be identified with God and his work to be our counselor, our one who guides and directs us, one who leads us in this life. And then clearly the next title, the mighty God, the phrase is El Gibor in uh, the Hebrew. El is the word God, you'll recognize that. Gibor, a mighty one, our hero. Now it's true, and what the liberals tend to do is try to say this, well, Gabor sometimes is used about simply a, a human hero. Even Ale is sometimes used as about a human re hero. This is not speaking of deity, just talk, start talking about it in elaborate language. Uh, uh, just a uh, great human hero. No, wherever this phrase occurs, the El Gabor together in the, elsewhere in the Old Testament, it's also always clearly a reference to deity. And so I think we write in understanding it and translating it this way. His name is Mighty God, a hero of a God, Mighty God. And this is the one that has been given to us, an everlasting Father. And you might say that's the title for the first person of the Trinity. But you know, the Lord Jesus is, in a sense, our spiritual Father in all of us who know him as Savior. He's our Heavenly Father in a sense. Not the first person of the Trinity, but as the head of the covenant. He is the Father of all of those who fall under Him in this covenant. The everlasting Father. And there again, deity is affirmed of this Father. Everlasting. He's always been. And then Prince of Peace. Here the work of this one, the idea that he shall bring peace and it is the peace that he brings and the only thing the only way in which you and I can ever know the peace of God is to come through this one to receive him as Savior and as Paul describes in Romans the early chapters the first th three uh, chapters there and four chapters he's talking about justification salvation is by faith alone if you are depending upon your works you will never have peace you know your works not won't stand up in the day of judgment if you're depending upon the preacher you know he isn't a perfect man either if you're depending upon the church it isn't perfect either but if you're depending upon the Lord Jesus then as Paul opens the fifth chapter of Romans, we have peace with God. That this comes because we've stopped trying to save ourselves. We've stopped resting upon anything else but upon Jesus as the Savior. And it's then that you can have peace with God because of who He is. He's the Son of God Himself. And he came and gave himself upon that cross to, lie, to die in our behalf and to pay the full penalty for our sins. And as we receive him, 
and the way our Presbyterian questions of mem for membership, you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner and without hope, save in the sovereign mercy of God. And do you believe in Jesus as the Son of God? And do you rest upon him alone for your salvation? You see, that's talking about the nature of saving faith. It's not just an intellectual knowledge about him. It's not even assenting that he is the Savior and I'm a sinner and I could be saved by him. That's not necessary. That's not all that's necessary. It comes to the matter of trusting in him, of resting upon him. That old illustration of the chair. You believe it's a chair. That's intellectual faith. It's a chair. You believe it's strong enough to hold you up. That's assenting to it. But you haven't rested upon it until you cast your weight upon it. And that's what is required in the act of saving faith. And I would urge if any of you here, perhaps raised in the church, have believed intellectually all these things, have assented to it, but never been willing to cast yourself upon him for your salvation, that you do that now. That you put your trust in him. Because who is he? He's the wonderful counselor. The mighty God. The everlasting father. The prince of peace. And you can only have peace with God. Through him. But you can have it. Through him. This is what he promises. He says I am the way. The truth and the life. No man cometh unto the father. But by me. But what he's implying. If you come by me. You can come to the Father. Then you can have peace as you come before the throne of God in the day of judgment that you know that though you've sinned, your sins have been taken care of by the Lord Jesus. And you can have peace with God, the Prince of Peace, in that special work of his ministry, of the increase of his government and of peace. There shall be no end from the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness and the, uh, the fact that he is the king is being described here he's going to uphold this with, with right justice and righteousness from henceforth even forever and you remember his own words as he uh, gave the great commission he says all authority has been given unto me there he was already, of course, the Son of God, but now as our Messiah, as the God-man, because of his completed work upon the cross and his resurrection from the dead, now all authority hath been given to him as the one who's seated upon the throne of David. And he's right there right now, ruling all things to his own glory and for our good. If you know him as Savior, what a comfort that is. That everything is under him and being done for your good. John Gerstner, the late John Gerstner, used to say with regard to the matter of predestination and that glorious verse in Romans 8, 28, all things that work together for good to those that love him that call according to his purposes. He used to say that once an event has taken place, we should be ready to say, I wouldn't have it any other way. Why? Not because we can understand why he took our loved one or why this accident ha happened or why the fire came and burned some of your homes and those th sorts of things. But when you recognize what his promise is, that he's working, he's upon the throne and he's working all things to our good if we know him as our Savior. And even though it's a tragedy for us in our lives at this point, to know that gives us the confidence that we can live through it and work out and see how he's working to our own good and for his own glory. And to see him then as the one that's seated upon the throne of David and his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from henceforth forever. And the zeal of Jehovah of hosts will perform this as the way this particular prophecy ends. And so we have this glorious declaration concerning this child. To be born of a virgin. To be Emmanuel, God with us. 
and to be this one who has these titles, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I trust that all of you know him as Savior, but knowing that some of you may not, perhaps some of you uh, young people have not yet made that commitment to Jesus. Now is the day of salvation. You'll have no, you have no excuse, no good excuse for delaying that commitment. And you're invited and urged to come and receive him in the terms of John 3.16. That whosoever believeth in him shall not, in the future tense, shall not perish, but have, in the present tense, everlasting life. And if you've not come to do that, come do it today. And for those of us who know him, as we hear again the old, old story, may we rejoice and thank God for the Savior that he's provided, the wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus, the wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee we thank thee and praise thy name for the gift of thy son through the womb of the virgin to become that mighty god everlasting father prince of peace wonder of a counselor for us we thank thee for him for his saving work upon the cross and our prayer is O lord that if there are any outside of his salvation here today that thou wilt touch their hearts and enable them by the work of thy spirit in their lives to come to him, to receive him, to repent of their sins and put their trust in Jesus as the great Prince of Peace, that they may find peace in their hearts with thee forevermore. And wilt thou refresh all of us as we think about his coming into the world to save sinners, Refresh all of us who know him as Savior with a wonder of that grace and help us to live for thee more faithfully day by day. And we ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen. The hymn of response is number 156. O Lord, how shall I meet you? Would you stand and sing praise to the Lord with me and then remain standing as we confess our faith using the larger catechism question found in your bulletin. Number 156, O Lord, how shall I meet you? <laughs> 